listening to caveradiobroadcasting.com. The words and opinions you are about to hear are of the hosts and do not reflect the management of caveradiobroadcasting.com. Good evening and welcome to Down the Rabbit Hole. Today's Thursday, July 27th, year of our Lord, 2017. You're listening to a Gen Pop Media production. Uh, we got most of the crew in here today. I did hear a vicious rumor that Cat would be dropping by. Just, really? Uh, yeah. It's been a yeah, minute. I heard a vicious rumor. It's been a minute. Yeah, but we got uh, we got Hooper, DiBiase, Tony D, myself. We got Chris behind the controls again. Welcome back, Chris. Hi, Chris. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, you know, <laughs> we're often tying our topics into current events and things that are going on and there's actually a, you know, this topic came up yesterday and uh, so we'll start to touch on it we may have uh, a little more on it next week but uh we want to talk about mind control and uh you know people hear mind control and they're all like oh what are you talking about man you know and it's like you know mind control is really really simple it's really really easy they just plant thoughts they just throw stuff out there and if you repeat it enough People will start to it, it starts to become patterned. It, it's it's hardwired into your brain. Well, it it becomes a mantra for some people. Yeah, absolutely. And there's there's a wonderful example of mind control going on right now. Um, you know, uh, Dave likes to bring up Edward Bernays, the father of modern advertising. Which Dave? This Dave or this Dave? No, you. It must be you. Yeah. You always used to throw his name out there, and we never knew who it was. He's just hes just one of the Sigmund many. Freud's yeah, nephew. but I mean, you know, he's all about advertising. Sigmund Freud's and, uh, and one of the, yeah, Sigmund Freud's nephew. And, and one of the things, uh, uh, you know, out of his book that, that uh, was basically, it's about controlling the narrative. It's, you know, he who strikes first controls the narrative. And this is, uh, these are tactics straight out of Nazi Germany for anybody who's cares to go back to the source. I'm, I'm sure it goes even farther back than that, but that's in, in modern history. And uh, you got that going on right now with uh, the biggest news story of the last few days, which is Donald Trump reversing the executive order uh, for uh, transgender recruitment in the military. Yeah, it's a big, uh, it's a big deal, apparently. And that's all you hear <laughs> is that all, all the, the 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 stories out there are that Donald Trump bans transgenders from serving in the military. Period. Right. That that's the story. Okay, so that's what everybody's got out there. But if you look into it, I mean, you got to ask yourself, well, why? Why would why would Donald why would why does he feel it's so important to to ban transgenders in the in the military? I mean, is he really that bad of a person? A homophobic, misogynist, well, he's, he's uh, xenophobic? A, no, he's uh, a bigot. Oh, he's a bigot. Okay, right. he's yeah, a that's bigot. that's why Donald Trump would choose out of all the topics he's dealing with that. Yeah, we gotta we gotta ban those transgenders well, today. That's, that's yeah. a real problem. Yeah. But what uh, most people don't realize is that it's actually the reversal of an executive order that was signed in June of 2016 by Barack Obama. And the deal was with the executive order is that it escalated quarterly starting in June of 2016. And on July 1st of 2017, they were supposed to go out for all-out recruitment and anybody recruited after that point would have the luxury to receive all of their uh, sexual reassignment surgery, all of their hormones, all of their treatments paid for by the military. They would treat that just like if you joined the military and were diabetic. You can't join the military if you're diabetic. Okay. Oh, so, so he hates diabetics too? Apparently even people who have... Epididymitis, like sore balls. Oh you can't join Lord. the military. Hermaphrodites can't join the military. He hates hermaphrodites too. Yeah, apparently. Um, well, at least well, the military. At least, at, least, at least the military does. I mean, there's very strict guidelines for what you'd be surprised at. Wow. Actually, there's even gastrointestinal guidelines. So if you have, like, you know, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, that might be on the list. I didn't go into. The, I I looked in just under the genitalia portion to see uh, okay. where. And as of, no, we see where your mind is. At least, well, because of this <laughs> okay. story. Um, and at least from what I can tell, as of September 2016, anyway, this has already been on the books as a disqualifier for okay. entering the military service. So I just learned in the parking lot here that, you know, you talked about this executive order that yeah. mm-hmm. that our boy signed last year, which actually I, I just realized once again 
how calculating this man was. He, Barack Obama, I, he's one of a kind, man. I got to tell you, man, I got to hand it to the guy. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he just, it didn't matter on that one how it turned out. Mm-hmm. How the election turned because out. Because if Hillary won, then it just would have gone on. And he wins. And if a Republican won, then they, then they're in trouble again. The, just like right, Trump they, is they in trouble it, right and now. And he wins. It's right. un- actually quite unbelievable. The well, guy, he's, the guy, I mean, you got you to give him credit. He's kind of brilliant. The guy in was his, a pro, man. In, in his, uh, <laughs> in his the scumbaggery. Guy, the guy was a pro, for sure. So you look at this. And, 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 he, he, and he's got, so, so everybody's all tied up with this. You know, transgender issue. You know, you, you half or for, half or against it. We got to have transgenders in the military. And really, the question that pops into my head is: first of all, I could care less. Yeah, I don't take okay. a position on it. Well, I, I don't have a position. It doesn't matter unless to me. it's costing us billions of dollars. Well, I mean, cause sexual, money, re, you know, sexual reassignment money. surgery is cheap. You know, obviously. I, um, I don't know. Yeah, it could cost upwards of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Well, you're not getting the tonsils removed, right? So yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's you're not bit, removing a splinter. A little bit bigger deal yeah. than that. But to me, the question that pops into my head is if you do the math, because the math never lies, as we yeah. we use that as our statistical basis for a lot of things around here. So we like stats, we like statistics, and uh, the math doesn't lie. So the question for me is, is, okay, so from a purely logic standpoint, why would you target a minority group that makes up less than 1% of the population for recruitment. Why would you waste your time? I mean, I did the math real quick, you know, based on, and I wasn't able to grab, to, to get super deep into it. I did this all in 10 minutes for a Facebook post, but, um, I, you know, ideally I would get military age people, the population, but you take the entire population of the United States, the amount of serving military is 0.4%, the amount of transgender out of the entire population is 0.3%, okay? Okay. So you do the math. You you, you, you take uh, the American population, which I don't remember what it was. It would be like 330, 330 million. Something, something like, like that. that. I think I used 325. It was, close it was 325 and change. Yeah, close So enough. I used 325 to round it. And uh, so based on 325 million people, um, you take 0.4% of that, and those are the people that are actually in a- active military. You take 0.3% of that, and those are the people who are who identify as transgender. Okay. And then if, if the rules of statistics would still apply, which they won't, because there's no way that the same amount of the transgender population wants to serve in the military than of the population at large. I guarantee you it's a higher percentage. Well, there's other factors involved, like age. Right. Age, I understand. That's what I'm saying. So you know, Ideally, it would probably. be military age. Yeah. But just real quick, doing the math, um, we're talking about 3, We're talking 6,500 people. Okay. Which is approximately... So, which, is, or, which is on the high, high end. On the high side. Way using high Using, using yeah. the, the rule, the same rule that I yeah. used. You're talking 6,400 people. So you're going to now recruit. You're going to you're going to gain 6,400 people from a group of which there is a 40 percent suicide rate among them. Yeah, among other things. So you're going to spend all this time and money, all these extra resources to recruit these people, and at the end of the day, you're going to end up with about 2,375. No, this is this is nothing more. At least from my deduction, as I sit here right now, because I haven't really looked too deep into it. <clears throat> from what I can tell, with my limited human mind. Uh, this is nothing more than pure politics. Yeah, that's all it is. Nothing more. And, because it and doesn't the make... thing that disgusts me most, the, the most about it, is that these people who have legitimate issues. Now, I'm not going to say that I'm not going to go out and I'm not going to get crazy and call it mental health, whatever it is. I'm just saying issues. They have legitimate issues. And they're being used. That's the problem. They're just being used. Yeah. And they're mad at the people who are kind of like, yeah, you don't really belong here. And it's for their own good. Well, if there's if there's obviously a, a dollar amount attached to this. There's physical health concerns attached to this. And, and I'm not an expert, but uh, it just stands to reason. This isn't about discrimination as much as it's about politics. Like I said, I think there's no mistake. It was a very calculated move that he issued that, the timing that he did given that it would run into the next, the new president's term. Uh-huh. This is this is so disgusting. What a circus. I mean, and, and in the meantime, from a position of compassion, okay, 
you have these people that are already, you know, struggling, say. Right. Th- with their identity, with their own identity. Um, they're being pawned out there. Yeah, as uh, political footballs, and that's what that's what just drives me crazy and it's about really all this. Disgusting, man. But you're right, though. The narrative has been this is an attack on the entire yeah. LGBT community. Yeah. When, like you said, the more you kind of dig into it, you realize it's actually a little bit more about the military and not the LGBT community. Because there's sometimes that when you're talking about the military, from what I can gather, the military comes first, right? I mean, obviously. Otherwise, you could join the military right now. Yeah, exactly. I, I would, could. I would be no good. Well, I'm too old. They have age restriction. It starts there. So there's age restrictions. You have to pass a certain physical test. There's certain illnesses you cannot have. Um, I mean, you even have a hard time if you don't have perfect eyesight. And those are all. The <clears throat> there's reasons for all that stuff. Well, there is reasons, and I don't. I'm not a military. But we, expert, we have taken. So. You know, we you, you don't have to be a military expert to know that. Well, you can use logic for it. You but use logic is you're, what you're looking for. What is the military for? It's, well, it's a fighting group. You also can't ignore history, and the, the history of it is simple, that the military creates its own standards. It has its own way of doing things for a reason. The reason is what you stated. I mean, it's uh, the military isn't a university. It's not uh, a church group or... A country no, club where you can sit here and claim discrimination. It's a little bit different. That, that's what I find weird with it because why all of a sudden is you know, arguably the left all of a sudden want to become part of the military. Well, now they love the military. Yeah. Yeah. Now they love the military. And now they love Navy SEALs. Yeah. Because one identified, one came out as transgender. When, when anytime, you can find videos of this. I've seen them myself. Anytime recruiters show up to these left-wing universities, you have these kook students and their professors out there overturning tables, spitting on yeah, repellent baby exactly. killers. Exactly, yeah. You know, oh, but all of a sudden now they're some kind of well, there they're was, bastions of the military, and they yeah, love the military. A, there's a transgender Navy SEAL. It's a little group, bit. So now there's a reason to love the military for them. Well, specifically the Navy SEALs, which not too long ago they actually hated. Yeah. So it's a little bit, you know, it's they, it, it, clearly they have no principle at all. They have no principle, but I'll give them this. I will give them this. They know how to fight, and they know how to win. Mm-hmm. As underhanded, as dirty as they may be, and as prince, uh, principalless, <laughs> if that's a word, all lack of principle, let's put it that way, um, they still know how to win, and they know how to fight. And I think maybe it's time, uh, maybe these guys in D.C. take notes and figure out what they got to do to maybe win something for once. Well, I mean, you don't even have to you don't even have to have facts to win an argument. You just have to yell louder and and uh, condescend better. Apparently that's it. And just change completely. Now all of a sudden McCain's a hero. Yes. Where in 2008, yeah. He was a wrinkly yeah. old man, yeah, now he was he's too a hero. old to run. Yep. Mm-hmm. He had all his health issues, he couldn't use a computer yeah, keyboard. Remember all that? Oh yeah, everybody hated McCain. Yeah. yeah. And then Trump makes a comment about him and now everybody loves McCain. Well, he gives a speech. And now Chuck Schumer loves McCain. Mm. <laughs> yeah, there's a piece really of you know these people. You, if really, you, if you watching? They're you so have, slimy. They jump uh, back and forth on every issue. It's unbelievable. It's like the Comey thing. Well, they didn't do this. I you mean, know, they love Comey. They hate Comey. It, 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 it's well, and this is where like the mind control aspect comes into it because exactly. just imagine. And, well, you know, I mean, everyone here knows because we were paying attention to it. Anytime anyone brought up Hillary's health, I mean, she was passing out, hitting her yeah, head, falling yeah. all over, forgetting stuff, and, I mean, she had handlers, and this was all on TV for everybody to see, but as soon as you bring up her health, you're some kind of misogynist. Oh, yeah, a horrible person. How dare you even yeah. buy, even bring that up? I mean, yep. I, really? And now they're talking about how Trump's the most unfit president physically. You know, he eats burgers and drinks Coke, blah, 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 but don't say anything like that about Hillary with her cankles. Uh-huh. I mean... That would you would be demonized for that. It's just it's double speak. It's uh, it's like George Carlin said. They the media tells you what and how to feel. That's true, because like you said, Trump banned transgender trans, transgenders from serving in the military. Mm-hmm. So now but you the end, whole end, story, end of sentence. End of don't. That's it. Yeah. So now everybody go, and then everybody's losing their collective minds over this, and the circus ensues. And I'm curious what it is they're trying to distract us from, actually, because it's pretty distracting. So there's something else going on. Well, the left says the left says that Trump 
chose to do this to distract us from the Russia issue, which is well, everything now, is Russia yeah. is now ready to break. There must be, you know, that's what they figure. And uh, yeah, the terrible, know, the terrible Russians as they push Russian style healthcare down our throats. Right. Very interesting. And then I, I, I literally I, saw you know, I, I, the thing I get angry about. Okay, I, I watch this. I get angry about it. And I if, you were, if you were to ask me, you put Vladimir Putin on the ticket against Hillary Clinton. Who would I vote for? Putin. I'm sorry, I'd vote for Putin. I'd vote for Putin. Oh, man, you make it really hard. You got to do that. Don't I'd you? vote for Putin. I guess I'd have to. At least I know who he is. You know, well, he's come out against satanic rituals. He's he's come out yeah. against all these different things. World banks. How, how did yeah. he come? What did he say about those? Uh, he actually kind of he kind of brokered he, the meeting between the uh, the Russian Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church not long ago because there was a schism in like 1100. Oh yeah, and it separated. Bam. Yeah, but they kind of got back together. So he's I would say he's a Christian. Mm-hmm. Well, reportedly, yeah, you know, rep- yeah, allegedly, <clears throat> he's. I don't read probably Russian. a killer. I don't understand but, Russian, so I kind of yeah. I'm kind of limited to what these translations say. Well. You know, so is it is it real or not? I've our seen our him, media's not going to talk. I've about seen this. him in church at least, in pictures. Well, so he, could be a photo op, but yeah. And if you and if you follow logic, or the pictures from NASA, all the all the people that are <laughs> all the people that are against the Earth Trump, is in the background. All See, the, it's all round. the people that are against Vladimir Putin, they're all the same globalist, elitist, whatever you want to call it. They're all part of the same group. Uh, reportedly, according to. You know, some of the sources like Wayne Madsen and uh, uh, Steve Pachanik and some of these other folks who may or may not be good guys. You don't know. They're all part of something. They are all part of CIA. Or were part of or are still part of. Or are still part of. <clears throat> but the point is, the claim is that there are two factions in Russia, just like there's two factions here yeah. in, in, the, in the U.S. You've got uh, one side that's... You know the globalist side, and you've got the other side that are, are against that. And they're supposed to be fighting each against each other, and it makes sense when you watch what's going on. Yeah, yeah, it does. And then you talk about controlling the narrative. Now we've all talked about the Navy SEAL who had did 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 she actually have gender reassignment surgery? Is is she actually a full blown woman now, or is she just cross dressing? Without photos, I don't know. Okay. Okay, I, I didn't know if they had it in the article, but I've seen, I've seen her and one transgender army guy on every station that are that are both speaking out for the military. Yet, at the same time, when I popped up, when I when I came across those two as the poster children for transgender dignified service in the military, uh, I ran across another guy on AllenBWest dot com who um, runs a website which I apologize, I have to get for you. Um, But he runs a website. This guy was uh, transgender. And I say was transgender because he had the gender reassignment surgery. He lived as a woman for eight years and then realized it didn't fix his problems. So he went back to being a man. Can you do that? I, I guess you can. Wow. But he went back to being a man. And is a, is an advocate for for these people. He has a, a website about about uh, gender reassignment regret, ah. hey, and he know. is a hundred percent behind banning them from the military. Well, well, tying tying this. The reason is though. See, this is where it needs to be elaborated on. Banning them from the military just sounds like such a discriminatory thing to say when. There's a reason behind like it. Like, you woke up and it's like, yeah, I'm going to have the rye toast with breakfast. Let's ban transgenders from the military, and then I'm going to run on a new suit. Well, I think it's deeper than that. I think, apparently, it's to reverse this executive order that had a big price tag attached to it. I don't know. I didn't do the math on it, but <clears throat> it seems to me like that's the issue. Is It's a financial burden that's unnecessary um, and doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But, again, like I said, I don't really... For me, I don't really take a position on it. I'm not a military expert, dude. I don't know. I just don't really care about it, I guess, <clears throat> the, the, that much. It's just funny to watch how it controls people like a like the ring in the bull's nose. Well you, well, you want to talk about the control part of it. The way you notice that is, is what Howard just brought up in my mind, is that first thing they do is they put a face to it, right? They show you somebody that was a Navy SEAL who's transgender or who was in the military as transgender 
and they have to make up a sob story for it so that you feel bad. It's like the kid that they had in Aleppo. You guys remember that right, photo? Right, which was fake, by the way. It was faked, right. All and, faked. His but, father was disgusted at what they used the images of his child for. Yeah, I, re- I read that. That was... Uh... So the guy I'm talking about, just for clarification, his name is Walt Heyer, H-E-Y-E-R, and he runs a website called sexchangeregret.com. Oh, wow. It's right in the title. Spent eight years of his life as a transgender woman. And uh, you don't see any good blurbs here. I apologize. It's a pretty long statement. But uh, he came out with a long statement and basically... uh, Ended it with, as a person who lived the transgender life for eight years, I can attest that assisting, affirming, or paying for hormone therapies and genital mutilation surgeries would not have strengthened our military. They would only have brought adverse long-term consequences, both for individuals and for our armed forces as a whole. Yeah, you, know, you would think the people that subscribe to groupthink would get that. Collectivism well, gr- I mean, would get that. You know, it's... So they're, it's, they're only, only, it's, only one, it's only good when it's supporting their cause. Well, that's typical of a communist, so I'd expect that. <clears throat> Speaking of communists, you guys know who Yuri Berevnikov is? I've heard right. that name before. B-E-R-E-M-E-N-O-V. Bereminov. I think you're thinking of Yuri Bezmenov. Could be bad. I have bad handwriting. And bad Russian. Bez- is this Yuri the, uh, Bezmenov. KGB agent that defected... And Psychological warfare. He was interviewed by uh, G. Edward Griffith. G. Edward Griffith. Yeah. yeah. Yuri, Yuri Bezmanov. Bezmanov. Former KGB. His job was to go in and infiltrate and basically slowly turn local population towards a communist way of thinking right. without using the word communist because people are scared of that word. It's kind of working here because we use the word socialism and replace, but socialism is communism it's the yeah. essentially the it's an identical concept uh, but what about him well that's he, he outlines this as you know how they talk about influence with spies and things like that he said that's a very small part of the russian uh techniques that they use inside their government okay and this is coming out in, in late 80s okay so <clears throat> he's basically has a four there's a four stage plan that was that they were all aware of that's supposedly allegedly uh he says that they've been doing to the US since the since they've been into the US World War Two well, since the beginning of the Cold War. Yeah, World War Two, Cold War. Uh basically has four stages that he goes through and and it because it has to go through multiple generations so that they get people used to these kind of different things and i think uh uh demoralization uh destabilization um normalization and in crisis these were the four stages or crisis then normalization and he describes how how it is supposed to work the interesting thing is whether you believe it or not when you look back and you see go through our history from that time until this time you see all these things exactly happening. He's talking about education. He's talking about, you know, the religion, all the different things. You know, when we say things are degrading here in the U.S., these are all the things he's talked about. This is back in the 80s. So, um, but it all has to do with psychological warfare. It all has to do with mind control and, and all the things that we're talking about. Yeah, Um you're totally right. Actually, there's four Besmanov quotes in this upcoming book, and I think one of the ones you were talking about, it, it's interesting. I had the same exact thought when I was listening to his interviews because um, you can call him a, a, a wacko if you want to. He's not, but let's just say you do. Forget the source of the information. The fact is, is he very accurately predicted something that is actually happening in the United States and has continued to happen. It, I, I remember paralleling it with the protocols of the learned elders, which had the of Zion added to it in the early 1900s, where people can go, oh, it's a fake document. It's, you know, it's conspiracy theory 101. It, it's a forgery. Whatever it is, 
it was in print as early as the 1890s. And whatever, I mean, that plan, which I think in the, it's a 24-point plan on literally how to take over the world, has been happening. It, it's, just, it's just unfolding. So uh, some people don't even look into it because, you know, when something gets debunked, they just <clears throat> they stop looking right there. Yeah, what's the main story on that is that uh, it was Russian propaganda. Is that right? Uh, well, that's, that's the that. first. Pl- it, f- it was originally published in Russia. Then it was published in the United States in 1905. And then again in 1920, it had another resurgence of popularity appearing in places like uh, the Christian Science Monitor, which at one time was a, was a big deal of a newspaper, and several other like very New York Times, very normal papers. And it really helped fuel this... Um, anti-semitic movement if you will in the united states i'm sure it was already in existence in one way or another but this is how this plan is so beautiful and diabolical because the plan is being implemented by somebody and it is often blamed on quote-unquote the jews which is so ridiculous A lot of people can't see beyond the fact that, you know what, first of all, the Jews that they're talking about, the Zionist Jews, this is not your regular Jewish banker or lawyer that we see in the street. What they're talking about are, literally, it's the synagogue of Satan, the ones that are pretending to be Jews but really are not. They're actual Lucifer worshipers. Now, these are the guys in control of the Federal Reserve, in control of Hollywood, in control of our media. There is almost, um, they control the vast majority of thoughts that come into the minds of humanity. This is not just the United States. And uh, these, the Zionist Jews, like the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, for instance, this is examples of who these Zionist Jews are. These are generational, demonic, bloodline families. And again, these guys are so covert and just so just diabolical they use the cover of their quote-unquote jewishness which they're not really even jewish as to get the rest of society to uh hate the jews to think that this is a jewish conspiracy that we're up against and they're nothing more than a straw man that is your typical jewish person there is not you know, there is not a conspiracy of the Jews we have in our lives every day. It's not like they have some secret on us. But the guys that are implementing this new world order, they are outwardly Jews, but inwardly are Satan worshippers. I mean, I don't know how else to say it more bluntly. They literally worship the fallen angel Lucifer. And they do it using all the same rituals that existed in the Old Testament which includes things like sacrificing humans, child sacrifice, pedophilia. And when you follow those links up to the you know, to the puppeteers, to the it always leads to these families. Maybe some names have been changed. We sh- went through some examples of that in a few shows back. And um like the one family that has not changed their name are the Huxleys. They just kept their name and were flat out you know, I would consider them a generational bloodline family. Can't prove it, but they seem to always fall on the side of anti-biblical themes. And for whatever reason, for almost 200 years in world history, they seem to have a microphone for the world stage. Whether it's T.H. Huxley, Aldous Huxley, Julian Huxley... It's like it's passed on and passed on. And the themes that they promote, they were critical in having evolution be accepted. Because evolution hits the world stage in 1959, and you've got these already propped up figures like T.H. Huxley and several others who immediately come out long before this could ever be vetted. They come out and say, this is fact, this is fact, this is fact. Yeah, like 1859, right? 
What did I say? 1959. I meant 1859. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. And immediately schools then start to adopt it. And I, I really believe, you know, through secret societies, the you know, literally the agents of Satan start to bring this on. And it was a coordinated effort. It doesn't mean that, you know, the, the dean of, of science at Harvard is in on the whole plan. He's just been convinced that you can accept this, put it into your school. And people that would put up a fight, next thing you'd know, they're out of a job, they're dead, or their children are hijacked, or they're in prison. And it's, then they have the, well, you can't believe, you know, X, Y, Z, that this guy's a, this guy's a criminal, he's in prison. And, you know, so then they debunk the truth. And when you have authority figures all in unison saying something, it is it takes a lot of balls and guts to go against that. Well, they, they still teach it to this day. So and it hasn't gone away. No, we've got a chapter on intelligent design versus evolution. And it literally begins in 1860. And actually, evolution was a pagan theory that goes back a thousand years it's not like it was introduced by darwin but the right marketing program was applied on on darwin's swing at the plate and it was accepted and something you said which ties to besmanov tony is he was talking about how it takes about 20 years to indoctrinate a generation Mm -hmm. and once that happens um it's hard to Ever like once you lose that truth, it is hard to ever get it back. Like they they will carry it on and carry it on. Well, I think he uses uses the uh, analogy that you can tell them, you can show, you can do all these things, and, and and they won't believe it because they've been so heavily under this mind control that that's that's their belief system, and you literally would have to show them something, you know, against that. It's just like we, we talked about. Even before. then, it's, even then, it doesn't work. Even then, it's it's hard to break them once once you're indoctrinated in indoctrinated into that thought process. You're stuck there, and and you find it. And I'm sure Howard and, and you guys have known when you talk to friends of you known on Facebook forever, and you tell them this, and it's like, <sighs> come on, that's you know they'll totally. Deny it. Yeah, they won't like, listen to it. They won't. You don't believe that, do you? Yeah. Like that I mean, kind won't of, look you know, that into kind of it. Response, it's right. just. Yeah. There, just, there's boom. a quote somewhere in here. I don't even know who it's from, but it, it basically says when a package of lies has been sold to the public for years and years and years, the person that comes out speaking the truth down the road will sound like a raving lunatic, even though that's the one telling the truth. Yeah, we, we had that experience recently where Dave and I were talking to a group of young people, and we're talking about God, okay? We're talking about Christianity, okay? And, you know, I mean, there's some, <clears throat> for someone who doesn't believe in it, I mean, there's some pretty crazy stuff you got to swallow to be a Christian, right? You yeah. Know, you have to deal with a lot of crazy stuff. Crazy now. Cra- but what's... I, it wasn't crazy but for I'm all saying, of history up right, until around right. 1860. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm just that saying for someone someone of our age from our time, if, if you've just been, I mean, if you were where we were all a few years ago, it was kind of crazy. I'm not buying all that, you know, dude in the belly of a whale. and you know, like, right. I ain't buying none of that. And these, as we're, Dave and I are taking our turn speaking on, on, a, on a various topic, these kids are totally like listening. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. No, they got it. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. And then I mentioned 9-11. And I watch five of them roll their eyes and throw their heads back. Yeah. And it's like, well. <laughs> well, because they're now, as part of curriculum in school, they, oh, teach, I know. they teach a yeah. section on 9-11. And I'm sure as part of that curriculum, they're sure to point out oh, yeah. all the whack jobs that oh, yeah. said it's possibly, <clears throat> maybe even, yeah. an inside job or some bigger picture there. So they're already warned against the truth by labeling it deception and use deception right. to warn against the truth. It's very, but I, I was just shocked to find that in the environment we were in, yeah. you know, I mean, pretty much if, if you're going to, if you're going to buy the whole Bible mm-hmm. story, your mind should pretty much be open to anything. Well, let's face it. You're in a room full of people that at least 
allegedly believe in things you can't see. Right. That doesn't get a whole lot more preposterous than that. Exactly. And if you believe in God, you think you'd believe in what he had to say. And he spent a lot of lines in that Bible talking about, look, the enemy of humanity is this devil guy. He's very real, and he's going to have most of you fooled. So they'll believe in God, but in a sense will think that he wasn't telling the truth about this Right, piece. right, or it, that well, it you can't have fooled me because well, I watch the news every night. Yeah, I am way right. too educated. Here's the quote by Besmanov that I think Tony, you were trying to get at, um, and it wasn't an interview with G. Edward Griffin. This one was 1984. The quote was from him: "It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which is required to educate one generation of students in the country of your enemy exposed to the ideology of that enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology (coughs) is being pumped into the soft heads of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism or American patriotism. Now, this is a former KGB agent. The result is that these people are now occupying the positions of power in the government, yep. civil service, business, mass media, and the educational system. Well, whether that guy's a whack job or not, he's spot on. You are <clears throat> stuck with them. You cannot get rid of them. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind, even if you expose them to authentic information. Yeah, right. yeah because I'm seeing this also in school with, they now do a section on religion in school. <clears throat> and I was actually quite taken aback by what they're teaching, because uh, they touch on Christianity really quick. It's basically just a thing. Um, they don't even mention the resurrection, which is the basis for the faith at all. Because um, without it, there is no Christianity, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's pointless. But without, if you stop before the resurrection, you're actually talking about Judaism. And that <coughs> leads me to my next point. They do a section on that, too. And they do a section on Islam. And according to the, the of guidelines of the curriculum... Um, Islam and Judaism are exactly the same thing, pretty much the same thing. In fact, um, even goes so far as to say that Islam um, holds their women in very high regard and respects them and treats them like, you mm. know. And I'm thinking... And if it's in a textbook, it must be true. Where are they getting this information from? Because it's not the same as Judaism. It actually persecuted Jews and still does to this day. Well, let me ask, let me ask a stupid question. Back in the old days, yeah. okay, could could you become a Jew? Didn't you have to be Jewish by birth? Right. Didn't you have to well, be? If you in walk a, into a synagogue, you and say, convert. I want to be, They'll try to talk you out of it, like you. Re- but you can become one. But I mean, I'm talking back in the day, no. fifteen hundred years ago. Jewish being being Jewish, that was a birthright, wasn't it? And it was actually part of their law to not intermingle with other people. Yeah. So they were very isolated. That's how they maintain their identity. So um, therefore, I mean, Islam and Judaism are nothing alike because Islam is openly recruiting people, and Judaism, y- you can't. Well, right, and it, and it's the, the teachings are not nowhere near at its origin the same. They're nowhere near the same. They didn't start the same way. They didn't start at the same time. Um, right, and Jews didn't conquer anybody. They were conquered over and over and over and, and over and, and over, over and, and over. Still, almost. Um, but, but I just will, find it they shocking, They will not though. be conquered again. Right, that's according true. To the, they, that's it, true. They will come down to, they'll be down to their last bullet, and that is when Jesus Christ shows up, and the, the rem, this small remnant of what will be left of Israel after it's pounded by, you got all the Ishmael countries, right. which is the Muslim world, yeah. and they're going to lose, by right. the way. Then you're going to have the Gog and Magog invasion, which is going to have the whole world surrounding this little strip of land that is as big as it, New Jersey. And it's, it's about to be game over, and that's when Armageddon happens, which is 
basically 200 million soldiers there to take over Israel are going to be vaporized in, I'm guessing, a few minutes. If. And the blood will be so high that it will be, you know, horses will be swimming in it in the Megiddo Valley. Yeah, and that's when the remnant will stand around and go, oh, we did miss it the first time. (laughs) Because they're still waiting for him to show up, right? Well, that's when they're going to... And then so Jesus still Christ the shows time. up on his, with his mm. white horses and all of his armies of angels. And I don't know if we're in that crew or if we're watching from the balcony. I'm not sure. And It really depends on who you talk to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, and there's a lot of differing opinions, even amongst, you know, well-versed Bible scholars. And uh, he's going to land on the Mount of Olives. He's going to crack the mountain in half. Yeah, right. right down the middle. And... Of the remnant, it's the it's always like the remnant of the remnant of the remnant. And of those few remaining ones, one third of them will run towards this massive explosion, this huge cracking of a mountain, because they will know in that instant, because they know, know just enough of their Bible that, holy cow, he really was the right. Messiah. We really did kill him. Yeah, we missed it. And two thirds of them, the idiots p- portion of the remnant, the slot, <laughs> they're going to run away from this. Yeah, the ones that run towards them will be saved. They will be the that will be the remnant of the chosen people yeah. left. And again, you know, if God can, if He can wait for eight people before he lays a flood on planet Earth. Like, Satan was down to eight people. Yeah. That's how close he came to blowing up God's plan to create a kingdom. Um, I think it will be more than eight. In fact, I think... And I now have faith in, in the Bible. It has predicted all of human history before it happened. No other book, No other book can do that. Has done it, has ever done it. And you can measure it statistically. We went into a few of them yeah. a few weeks ago. and it, Well, the numbers get really bad once you start adding them up. Calculators can't handle the numbers. They're so bad. Yeah, you've, you've just got to choose to... You really... If you get that far where you're pulling out a calculator and adding this stuff up, and you are not... You don't get it, or you don't want to get... This is not logic anymore. This is not intelligence at work. This is a moral decision to turn your back on God. And, you know, that's just, that's not going to be a good day for yeah. a lot of but you people. Can, what that guy said is interesting about the, uh, the people being contaminated. In other words, even when shown actual proof, data, evidence, etc., still can't change their minds. This is what they're doing right now with this lesson plan here because... I'm running into this with people our age, actually, where it doesn't matter even if you show them the text yourself and be like, here, read that page. Yeah, they won't read. They just won't read it. Well, that's a misinterpretation. Yeah. Well, you don't really know because it was in a different language. Oh, and it's out of context. It was a long time ago. I'm like, not really. I mean, when it says, you know, something simple like my name is Fred, there's no way to misinterpret that. Yeah. It's pretty much someone saying that's my name is. Um, It's not a complicated thing, but... You just can't get through the brick wall that's been put in place, and that's what they're doing now. So you're really going to deal with now a generation of kids that are going through school that will basically understand that all religions are exactly the same. They're just beliefs. Yeah, just pick one that works for they're you. They're just beliefs. Yeah. You know, um, who knows? I mean, how do we know? You know, Vishnu is not the right god. How do we know that? You know, blah 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 blah. And, and the sad thing is, is y- you put you poison. Can, you can know. You can. But the thing is, is when you use this kind of tactics, um, it, this is going to require now something beyond mankind. This is going to require the Holy Spirit to do something to these people because it's just impossible to even if you say, hey, look, this, you know, that wall is gray. And they're like, no, it's not. It's red. I think that's been one of the hardest things emotionally about writing this book because it, it has taken a much bigger emotional toll on me than I ever bargained for. But in doing it, I've come to this conclusion that we're, we're screwed. I mean, as a, as humanity, we are in so much trouble and they're literally the clamp on humanity 
that is invisible to so many people. I just yeah. don't understand it. It's pretty wild. It is. It is so vicious. There is. There's like. I'm, there's nothing. There's no president. There's no army that's going to fix this. There. I, and I, and that's where I literally go. The only thing that can fix this literally is a miracle from heaven, and which the Bible says is what will have to have. Yeah. Which what will have it to happen? It just gets really, really, really nasty first. Like if you think <laughs> yeah. you you look into nine eleven, all right. Anyone that looks into nine eleven. Now I should say this: of the people that earnestly look into nine eleven, I'm going to say four out of five open their eyes to nine eleven. Of that group, uh, one out of twenty may end up. Linking the whole thing together like, oh, my God, this was an operation pulled off essentially by the Illuminati, the synagogue of Satan. It's just it's a small opera. It seems big to, you know, you discover 9-11. You think this is the end all be all of all conspiracies. Yeah. But you just realize, wow, it's just actually a medium sized to small operation leading to a new world order. We needed to get our military into the Middle East. Now, why we didn't stay there from... The first Gulf War, I'm not sure. But I don't, I, I, when you've got Pope John Paul II in 1990 saying, by the end of this decade, we will have a new world order. He was expecting it to happen by the year 2000. And we're sitting here now in Kuwait in the early 90s, in Iraq, in, and for some reason we all, we put, it's like, it's like the plan had to be put on hold for some reason. I wouldn't be surprised if it was, Something supernatural at the end of the day that did that. I well, you I, have you have the uh, the restrainer, right? I mean, God literally keeping his finger on it, keeping all this evil at bay, and that's what's going on. So when he decides to lift his finger, that's when the red horse rides, and then there's two quotes I want to share with you. One is just to tie something we've talked about a few times, and the fact Tony that you brought up. Yuri Bezmenov. Uh, we've talked a lot about K flight uh, KL007. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're all familiar with that. Yep. Are you familiar with that? Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's the flight where Nixon is told to deplane in Anchorage, and Larry McDonald, who was openly speaking out about, look, the, these people are using your tax dollars to enslave you, and he he was getting a lot of press he was on this plane which was shot down now yuri bezmanov was deep inside the kgb when this happened and he talked about this with g edward griffith and his quote was this the korean airliner incident kal 007 from my viewpoint is not an incident in quotes is not an incident at all I believe was a carefully planned and premeditated provocation. I'm not sure whether they killed 268 people just to get rid of Larry McDonald. He mentioned Larry McDonald. But it's feasible. I wouldn't be surprised if they killed more than 60 million of their own men just to implement rotten ideals of Marx and Engels. What would 268 people matter? Secondly, it was not... A military blunder the order was not given by the military the order was given by a civilian in the party apparatus of the highest caliber now this is the Illuminati this is the financiers behind all governments pretty much except for maybe Cuba and North Korea and a couple yeah for now the order was given by a civilian in the party apparatus of the highest caliber and I wouldn't be surprised if it was Yuri and Dropoff, and in any case, and Dropoff knew perfectly well what was going on. It's quite interesting. And the, he himself mentioned Larry McDonald, yeah. which meant he was on intelligence reports on the radar screen of the Russians back then. I'm sure at the highest echelons of power, the Russians know. I think Putin knows. He, he knows what the new world order is. Bezmenov was a Russian journalist and KGB informant for the Soviet Union before his defection to the West in 1984. And I recommend you write, reading this book. It's fascinating. He wrote a book called Love Letters to America, 
under the pen name Thomas Schumann, liking, likening himself to Winston Smith. You know who Winston Smith is? Mm-mm. No. Sound familiar? No. John's brother. I think he's he's the hero from George Orwell's book, 1984. Oh, okay. Ah. Love Letter to America was a warning to the United States of a global conspiracy involving the installation of a socialist communist of socialist communist ideals as part of a plan to bring about a new world order. In 1983 at a lecture in Los Angeles, Besmanov, answering questions from the audience, spoke of the Soviet Union shooting down of Korean Airlines Flight 007 for the purpose of killing Congressman Larry McDonald specifically. Up to the time of his death, Congressman McDonald spoke out frequently of his inside knowledge of the Rockwell Rockefeller family's drive to create a new world order, assimilating socialist and communist ideals into a tyrannical world dictatorship with the world's elite families like the Rockefellers and Rothschilds ruling over the rest of humanity. By the late 1970s and early 80s, the plan for new world order was still in its highly secretive stage and that's what larry mcdonald was screwing up now it's public information yeah i mean now you can go on the united nations website and you've got every leader of every major nation saying new world order new world order new world order i mean yeah. well they've had it, f- it, more it than the one salt pope, dec- you know more than one pope out there talking about it so exactly yeah, it's, it's mainstream now um it's not just a ministry song anymore it is not you ready for break dave Sure. Remind me of the second quote when we get back, right. because okay. I think it'll explain if you have personal relationships in your life with some people where you just don't understand why you can't get along with them. The next quote we read when I come when we come back, it might explain a lot. OK, mm, we'll look forward and to it's that. very mysterious because it has no author right now. We're going to take a break and we will be right All back. My people in the struggle. Welcome back to down the rabbit hole. So uh, I want to pick up right where we left off. I don't want to. Get off on a tangent as we tend to do sometimes. I want Dave to do his quote because I'm just dying yeah. to, to, to hear this quote. So, If anyone can tell me who said this, um, I'll buy him a cocktail because right now this is the only unsourced quote in the book. It, and it was part of a 15-page paper that I have read. It's all over the place, but no one has taken credit for it. One of the passages in there, um, it basically... Whoever wrote it, and I don't know if this was written in the 1800s or if it was written last year. I, I, I do not know. Uh, it basically, it starts off with, um, well, here, I'll just read this quote. The battle between the children of God and the children of disobedience is raging today. And there are myriad levels of, quote unquote, initiation or battlefronts into this conspiracy which is executing a secret plan of darkness, even as God's holy Bible is unfolding, the mystery of light or true illumination. As a consequence, we encounter numerous secret societies or societies with secrets, which all ultimately serve the same master. And this master is, of course, Lucifer, the, the Satan, whatever you want to call him. It was interesting because this guy's take on it was that the fruit that... Eve ate was sex and she allowed herself to get impregnated with serpent DNA then Adam was convinced to partake of the fruit which was seen as Adam also now having sex with Eve which created Cain and Abel one is Adam's genetic son and one is the son of Lucifer. And if you believe the Bible literally, like I do, God is sitting there and he's talking to three people in the Garden of Eden. He's talking to Adam, Eve, and the serpent. And from right then, I mean, th- this was the fall of man. I, I think we literally went from light beings and those coats of skins they gave us are the coats of skins we have now. Like, we became flesh and bone somehow. Don't ask me how. I have no idea. It's incredible, yes, but it's not as incredible as evolution is. I mean, you need more (laughs) faith in evolution than you do in creation. And from that moment on, even God said, I will put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, 
which enmity is hatred. I will put there will be hatred. And this article goes on to explain that most people, um, they're unaware of their participation in this because we're sold this story that humanity is one big humanity where he was talking about the fact that there's actually two races on earth. They, they, we, they both look very human and I don't know if this is related, but for some reason that the fact that 15% of the population has this or is missing this rhesus monkey gene there's something special about them there's roughly 20 or so percent of the population can be hypnotized but the the other portion just cannot be hypnotized why why and i'm wondering if it has something to do with a a genetic not a mutation because that implies accident but a, a, a genetic manipulation which began literally on day one I've actually heard that interpretation before, so I, I don't know that particular article, but a lot of people have written articles like that, interpreting the uh, the fall exactly that way, because it does raise the question, where did the seed of Satan come from, since God clearly states there is one. Right. It, it says so, plain language. So it does make you wonder, where does this come from? Now, you can say, well, that was from, you know, the uh, uh, Genesis 6 Right, sons of God going into the you know so maybe it was. But a, I think this was, was Genesis three. This was actually before right. the Nephilim. There was already, and that Cain was going to inhabit the land of Canaan, which right. would become modern exactly. day Israel, and that's why God specifically ordered the Jews that were you know ending their forty year hike through the desert. And as they're going into some of these camps, God said, I want you to wipe out everybody. Now, a lot of people use that as a reason to turn their back on God. What kind of God would have you kill all the women and children of a, of a village? Well, if it's for our own protection to keep genes and bloodlines clean, then I could understand it. If he's ordering us to do this to keep this evil element out of the world I, I could see it and the funny thing is is the tribes that weren't wiped out because some uh, I want to say it was Solomon or no King Saul disobeyed God on several fronts and a lot of times the Jewish shoulders came back where they did not wipe out the whole right. town and when you learn who are who are these people like the Edomites for instance um, that were not wiped out, those are all the hotbeds of activity right now in the Middle East. Like the Palestinians are the descendants of these. This is the battle of Israel and Palestine today. And I'm wondering if that would have happened had the orders been followed 3,000 years ago. Well, I think clearly not, but they didn't listen, so... Yeah, you know. we've just done this to ourselves. You hear that a lot, though. How could, you know, how, well, I mean, he pretty much drowned the entire planet except for eight people. So I, he 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 can get pissed and do stuff at the same time as be loving as well. I mean, there's it's a, it's a it seems, what's the word there, dichotomous, but it is. But keep in mind that this is actually a statement of, God's sovereignty. He does whatever he needs to do. It doesn't really matter what we think. Right? And not believing it doesn't make it any less true. Yeah, and we don't need to understand it. No, clearly not. Just the same way if your dad says, go rake the leaves, you don't need to understand why. If your dad says it, you you just, you go do it. Well, you get the same answer, right? It's because I said so, that's why. Right. And it's clearly clearly a reflection of the same relationship we have with God as we have with our children it's reflected we're directly in his image it means that literally um the the same dynamic takes place there as it does w- as adults with God right so there are times when the answer would be i can imagine anyway we ask why and he would just say because i said so that's why just do it 
it, it, he knows, so we don't know. You know, and that's where you get, well, I just don't believe that. Well, like I said, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. He doesn't need you to believe it. You need to believe it, but if you don't, that doesn't make it less true. It's just like this, we brought up the transgender thing in the beginning. There are people now that come out and say they just don't believe the whole XXXY chromosome biology. They don't, they just don't believe it. Well, okay. I don't care if you don't believe it. It's biology. We know this. So not believing it doesn't make it now all of a sudden not true, right? I think the same is true with this. I mean, there's, there will be people that don't believe it, and that's fine if you don't believe it, but I, it doesn't make it less true. Yeah, you know, I've, I, wonder how, I wonder how God is going to react to um, purposeful agnosticism. So I gave you the example. I've got this friend, smart guy. He's a very successful banker, investment banker, masters in business, yada, yada, yada. And uh, he's one of two people that I know of, I'm sure there are more, that saw the movie and at least had the guts to confront me and say, well, this particular guy said, you know, I, well, I just don't believe in conspiracy theories. And... Uh, I was trying to think of how to counter that because I, I kept my I, I shut my mouth in that moment because I was about to say something that might have hurt our friendship. Um, but to me, it's tantamount like saying, well, I don't believe in the weather because either way you slice it. Talking about 9-11, it was either a conspiracy by 19 guys wearing sandals and caves that pulled this off or was a conspiracy done from within positions of power inside of our own government. It's a conspiracy the way you slice it. Yeah. So your argument of, I don't believe in conspiracies is really no. I mean, it, it's, <clears throat> well, it's not an argument actually because that, that's what I mean. It's yeah. per, this is this perp. I'm, I'm choosing to not have an opinion, which I think is in a lot of ways cowardly. Well, you're just choosing to believe whatever's fed to you. On the tube, right? If somebody in a suit on TV says it, it must be true. Move on instead of actually looking into it. Now, does that, in your mind, does that constitute an idol? Like if you listen to, you know, because Anderson Cooper says something on television, you listen to that more than even your own eyes or even, does that constitute an idol? I think think if you put that above what God says, then yes. I would agree with that. Well, if that's the case... Is. I mean, then humanity's effed. I mean, we're just... Well, well it's, it's, it's idolatry all over Isn't there an example the of what we were just talking about earlier? You can show somebody the truth, but they still won't believe it. Right. Yeah, it's the old, you can, well, you can lead a horse to water. Yeah. But there's something there that will not let them believe that. Well, you have, you know... Well, it's deep, keep it, it's keep it, deep, deep, deep programming. Well, that and... And w- along with that programming, because this is always seems to be tied to like uh, satanic activities, be it rituals or whatever. Um, there's a spiritual element to this, at least I believe. Me too. I, that you have literally to. have, and I mean, I believe what the Bible says. So if you couple with what the Bible's describing based on modern, say, scientific vocabulary, say, or modern language. Um, you can view this as, I mean, you have, there are tens of billions of demons, of unclean spirits, whatever your interpretation of demons, whether it's fallen angels or, you know, um, disembodied souls of the Nephilim, whatever your take is on that. There's many different, le- in my opinion, there's it, many different there's levels all, of demons. It's of not course, just but, one type of demon. But there's, there's all different interpretations of what demons are but the fact of the matter is is there's tens and bi- tens of billions of, th- of these things and the best way to put it is when they the bible refers to them as unclean spirits right so whatever they might be for the purpose of this doesn't matter um there's tens of billions of these things and they're right at the veil right at that dimensional separator that keeps them only kind of in this in our world but not really you know, there's this separation like a pane of glass, right? I mean, it's like looking out the window. And unless, 
if you're looking directly out the window and there's no backlighting, you can't see the window, but it's there. You know it's there. Just like the veil, which is this this the the separation between our dimension and the other dimension. Um, now, if the light hits that window at a certain angle, then all of a sudden you can see the veil. And this is this is kind of an analogy to when you finally see this, then you know it's real. You know this is going on, and these things are constantly interacting with us all the time, good and bad, by the way. So you have you have it's the whole Looney Tunes thing with the red guy on your shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder. Yeah, I think that metaphor actually that's is how it woven is woven in a, a lot of truth. It's a tug of war that's going on constantly and depending on what you're grounded in. If you are of the 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 group that is the you know, I would say the atheist scientist type um which is actually kind of an oxymoron, but anyway, um you know that whole that whole where there's no God, everything is you know by accident, and there's always an explanation for everything, and spending all your time doing whatever you can to say and prove and show that God is just a fairy tale, right, and that science explains everything. You're really kind of now on the other team, even if you don't realize it. Right. Well, like we were talking about the police officer who came through. De- using detective skills, to, the, which he uses to solve murders. Yeah, Jay Warner Wallace. Yeah, and he, um, he, uh, where was I going with this? He does not see that. Um, it's because uh, he was the one uh, that basically investigated. Jesus' resurrection, right? Right, came to right. believe holy cow from this a forensic is real. from a forensic point of view. And he can't understand how a conspiracy can exist. Um, yeah, because no one can keep their mouth shut, isn't that? Wasn't his, yeah, his distinction? Much. Yeah, that was that was pretty much his answer. People couldn't keep their mouth shut, but that's yeah. that is an interesting from a detective, because a good example of this would be the um, uh, what do they call the atomic bomb program? Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project. I think there was like 130,000 people involved in that program mm-hmm. at one given time, and that secret never got out. It's not like some well, of see, these things, there's only <laughs> maybe six people involved. Yeah. One, but, one but, of the things he said, though, that, that you needed was some kind of power over that, too. And if you're working for a power where no one else has power over you, I, I could bring you into a room and say, Dave, you're going to tell me this truth, and I'm going to try to get it out of you. Well, if I don't have – if there's any – Nothing I can do to you. What are you going to say? Right. No. no. I don't need to tell you nothing. Right. Right. That's the way I think he, he said, you know, like when you have a police department or something like that, you've got the power. This is where I kind of disagreed with him when he said you can't have a. I totally conspiracy. disagree with him. He's yeah, completely they do, they do dis- it every day. He's completely discounting the fact that there is an antithesis to Jesus, to God, which is Satan. And he also has power yeah and believe me he's got a lot more power than the police than any government than any gun than any guillotine i mean that there's no doubt in my mind that fallen angels interface with humans i mean at the highest levels i've just seen too many people that actually do talk about it like he said you know people would talk about it and he just doesn't understand right now that our entire media system is controlled by dark forces. But we're trained to think that, well, dark forces are going to come at us with horns and ribs and a red, you know, right. horns and robes and a red face and a pitchfork. And I'm like, no, dude, they're actually going to come looking like beautiful women and goodness. And yeah, you won't see it coming. You won't see it coming unless you are. You got to have the right tools in the toolbox, man. So if, you know, if you're going to go fix a car. And all you bring is a folder with some paper in it. You ain't getting very far. You don't have the right tools in that toolbox to to deal with that. So you won't be you won't be well equipped to see it when it shows up, and you're certainly not going to have any presence there that's going to ward it off. Because keep in mind that there is a power much greater than anything Satan could ever come up with, and that's that's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I mean, God is way more powerful than. Satan could ever, I mean, he dreams about it, but this is never going to happen because the one thing that I think you can get your head wrapped around to separate the two other than the fact and good and evil is that, like, Satan has locality, right? Like, he can't, he's not, 
omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at the same time. He can't. Right. His demon, he can, b- but he's got proxy. Well, he's got his... tens of billions of soldiers out there in the form of these demons that are doing his dirty work for him. And they, they operate in gangs. Um, this is outlined clearly in the Bible. You can go read it for yourself. It's how these things operate. They communicate with each other. They know things about people because these things have been around a long time. So that's how you can be tricked. And I, it, it, I think people expect whether you're talking about God or you're talking about evil forces, people are expecting these big, like, theatrical, dramatic show-ups. So if they're you expecting call. the exorcist. It's not anywhere near that. I mean, I think things like that do occur, minus maybe the pea soup puke thing, but and the head spinning around. I mean, maybe that happens, but um, I think a lot of it's so subtle that, and, and it's things happen over time, so... As you do things in your life to open these doors and you take influence from dark things, their power in you increases and their influence increases to the point where this kind of programming works. See, that's where I think that this is more than just social, meaning it's more than just a relationship of a typical human with their environment. They're... I think there is something genetic about this, and I think that's why genes and bloodlines are such, they're so emphasized all throughout the Bible. It, it's almost as if, depending on the percentage of serpent seed, because I want to say the word is mesogenesis, which is the mixing of breeds. Like this article I was referencing, the, the unnamed one, which talked about how... You can mix breeds. You can mix a horse and a donkey, two of God's creations, to get a mule, which is not a. That's what I don't know. I'm not saying that's what this article said. I don't know if I, per, you know, personally believe that, but it sure as heck might explain. Uh, well, mules, interesting example. Why it's probably why he uses it is because mules end up sterile as a part as a result of that that interbreeding between horses and donkeys. So a mule is sterile at birth. So they don't have that drive. That's why they're such good beasts of burden is because they don't ever have the mating season to deal with. They don't ever have to worry about any of it because they don't breed. They're born sterile. So it's a one-off. That's probably what why he uses the mule as an example. Because you can, I mean, German shepherds and labs mix, whatever. It doesn't mean anything. There's no significance there whatsoever. Well, it's still a dog. Genetically speaking, it's still a dog. So when did we get done mapping the human genome? I don't know. This was like in the early 2000s, yeah, late 1990s. I mean, this when you understand DNA and genetics, it evolution is out it's completely out the door. And it's interesting that and there are thousands of scientists. Like that people say we're all the scientists. The only person talking about evolution is literally Richard Dawkins. Unless you are one of the deceived. There are some deceivers, there are the deceived, and then and there's, there's a few different, you know, statuses you can... Well, it's, it's getting, uh, it's getting, uh, they're, they're panicking now because they've come up a term with peop- for people like us. We're evolution deniers. There's actually a derogatory term now for people with our views like the climate deniers and yeah you're an evolution denier but what i'm wondering is <laughs> so there's another done, label right yeah they end up map mapping the april, whole human dna package april 2003 okay interesting thanks for looking that up they started right. in 1990 all right oh, 13 so years. <laughs> this is brand new information and i mean i can't i had to just stop taking unbelievable quotes of evolutionists that have converted to creationism simply on the recent data that has come out of DNA research. Because when you actually, I mean, we don't take the time to look into it because, dude, it's basketball season or nah, soap opera's on. I mean, there's always something else to well, do. Look, I mean, the Smithsonian evolution is real. Oh, yeah, I like saw. A, the plastic monkey men idols that are people worship. Which is what those are, by the way. So we've got 15 billion lines of code. 
And those are divided up. I think for a human, we've got about 60,000 genes. And correct me if I'm wrong. These are little things that determine blue eyes, hair color, things, height, blah, 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 blah. And for each gene, there's a bunch 20 of... 20 to 25,000. Okay. Thank you. It's not nearly as big a number as the number of DNA lines of code. And you've got these four proteins that have to mix together. And if there's a mistake anywhere, the whole system shuts down, just like it does for a computer program. You, you throw in an extra period somewhere, and you shut Windows yeah. down. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't add functionality. It ne- you know, entropy has always been at work. It is a law, not a theory. Entropy being the second law of thermodynamics. Things break down. Deteriorate. All the time. That's right. If you're going to keep transferring, you know, you pull oil out of the ground, you're going to lose. Some's going to spill on the way to the gas stations. I mean, it. There's always a breakdown. Well, wheel bearings. You, know, you make a mechanical example out of it. A, a good example I I like is you know the proof that our or a way to. I don't know if you call it proof, but it's more of a comparison. To, to illustrate how our DNA is breaking down over time due to entropy, which actually is the opposite of what evolution says, that over time we got better, when actually we're not. We're actually inferior than we used to be That's a lie out of the pit of hell. It absolutely we is. We are not advancing. We are we're degrading. Yeah, we There's no are. doubt in my mind. But what was cool is you take, you know... Everyone's made a photocopy before, right? So if you take a copy and then you copy that copy and then you copy that copy and then you copy that copy and you copy that, by the time you get to 20 copies, you can barely read it. Yeah, I mean, in the movie Multiplicity by the fourth guy, Michael Keaton's fourth copy, that's where humanity right, yeah, is. That's I mean, <laughs> that we're that dumb. Yeah. That's descended that's, from a good original. Right. So there's 15 billion lines of code, but we've figured out, and Howard, maybe you can tell me the number. You seem to be on a good site there. But there's only like 10 or 15% of our DNA that's active. 85% is dormant. Now, if evolution were true, how the hell is there 85% of our DNA dormant? Just think about well, that one. So for it's, a li- it's maybe suggesting that it's extra, <clears throat> right? So why is that there? I think that was on Ancient Aliens the other day. Is that what you were watching? No. I don't know. No, I but the, rarely the, put on that see, boob tube. Actually, that show is, is, and the reason why I watch it is different than probably why most people watch that show. You can learn a lot by misinformation, uh, purposeful or accidental. But a, a lot of it is actually accurate historical information that actually gets ignored in mainstream history and mm-hmm. archaeology. But these guys bring it out. And the thought that always crosses my mind is that these these guys on that show, man, they are so close. You just substitute to get the word it. ancient alien for demon, and everything they say makes sense. If yeah. they're so, I mean, they talk about the Bible constantly on that show. They bring it up all the time, and they try to, they take it and say, well, it was probably a misinterpretation of technology. And, and then they go off on a, t- it's like, dude, you were right there, and you just, you just, you just passed the driveway, man. You, 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 it was right there. It's like you've decided to believe Zachariah Stitchin instead of Jesus Christ. They're just it's basically so what it boils down to. You're putting more emphasis. Like our friend, I'm I'm so I don't want to mention names, but from the dinner party we went to a couple yeah. years back, he basically he gets the whole story, except he just believes that the Sumerian texts, he thinks they were there first, so that's the authority... And the Bible was a copy of those instead of the reverse, which is they were a counterfeit of the Bible. And the problem is, is the Sumerian texts, they don't predict the future. No. The Bible actually, I mean, it predicts unbelievable things. It's funny. That goes largely ignored. You don't hear a whole lot of talk about Bible prophecy out there. You hear all kinds of other stuff. Very few people sit there and break down prophecy I mean, so that... You, you could have a show that would be riveting. If you but think it's Ancient right Aliens is riveting, yeah. this would be riveting because these 2,000 predictions that are made before they happened, which now, I mean, history has proven them. Like one prediction, uh, Egypt was a powerhouse nation and... While the Jews were in captivity in Babylon, God tells Daniel, well, you know what, uh, Egypt, we're going to keep them around, but they will 
they're going to be a poor country for the rest of history. And that's exactly what happened to him. There's st- and he also said, and the Jews will lose their nation. And then well, a couple thousand years after they lose it, they'll get it back yet again. Now, how the hell can you predict? And not only that, it's not like that was the only prediction. It, then he goes into details of all the little things that will be going. If you just studied the rebirth of Israel, yeah. you should be, if there's an ounce of intelligence in your head, it should knock your socks off. Well, as I've seen people break this down to, and I do believe they have to use the calendar from the book of Enoch to get this. And if it's an if it's a mistake, it's an off. It's an no. Awful you can mathematically show that on May fifteenth, nineteen forty eight, was the exact exactly. Day. Sa- and they people have broken this down. And it's an awfully mysterious accident. If it is an accident, that it works out. I don't personally believe it's an accident. I think it's right on the money, exactly when they, he said it would be. Um, but just that you don't you don't really you don't really and I think that really kind of leads back into what we started the show with is you know. The mind control that's in play here, whether through propaganda or otherwise. I mean, dinosaurs died 65 million years ago. That's it. We evolved from monkeys. Period. That's it. Now the new thing is we probably came from another galaxy because half of our body is made up of things from other galaxies. This is the new mantra now that's out there. Um, so to convince somebody that it's actually not really that complicated but it's actually more complicated than that um is is sometimes just impossible well this is a good lead in to the mind control stuff because it operates well, just, on uh, answer your question real quick according to a 2015 article in the new york times 98.8 percent of our genes our dna is junk oh okay so that number 1. keeps 2%. going up yeah well that's junk or extra or dormant right that's what they're saying it's not and being, it's interesting it's because anything. Apparently, we share about <laughs> 90. I mean, th- one of the building blocks of evolution is that we share about 98 to 99 percent of oh, our maybe, DNA with maybe, a monkey. Maybe that's the junk. Maybe that's we the also junk. share 75 percent of our DNA with a dandelion, too. So I find that much more plausible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that makes more sense. If you rub Howard, he will leave a yellow. Yeah. mark. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. There's yellow marks yeah. all over me. Hey-o. So that to me, I mean, some people can. View that and say, oh, that's proof of evolution. And then other people can look at that and go, well, it's obvious that, it, that it's the same design team. It's like Honda. You know, there are similarities between a Honda Passport and a Honda Civic, okay? The, a Honda Passport did not evolve from a Honda Civic, but they were designed by the same designers. Right. They share a lot of engine parts. They, you know, there's a lot of, yeah. you know, there's a lot of. Well, I was just, the ancient aliens that I, and I don't watch it. Very often, I love that. Show. <clears throat> but I did record this. So I'm going to go back and watch it over. But this additional DNA they're talking about uh, is claimed now to be, could be, language or uh, a sign or uh, something from the designer. Yeah, from the aliens. From basically right. from the aliens. Oh, well, they're, that, they're leaving us a message. <clears throat> right. You need to look no further. You don't need to look in the stars. You need to look at this. Yeah, it's right here. The DNA. Yeah. It's in everything. Yeah. And they talk about all these. Well, all the these the coming deception is going to, without a doubt, involve you know whatever's in our skies, and, and you've got th- three layers to get through to understand this. First of all, you got to believe there's something in our skies. Now, this is where mind control comes in, and there are many different levels of mind control because there's there's what I'll call m- subtle, constant media brainwashing. People, right off the bat, when you say the word like UFO or alien, there's a shutdown. <laughs> You're crazy. They're just mimicking what they see on sitcoms and sure. movies. And, and the guy that plays a conspiracy theorist in every movie looks like a wacko every single time. They, yeah, lives okay, in a warehouse somewhere. That is a very, that's the first <laughs> yeah. line of brainwashing. Very simple. That's where Edward Bernays comes in. Um, one of his quotes in this book is going to be propaganda is the executive arm of the invisible government. Okay, that gets 80% of your basic idiot out of the game. This is, let's call this the war of the sheep. You got about 1% of the population that is literally down knowingly with Satan himself, thinking that he's here to free mankind, 
through knowledge. You know, he saved us He's from this tyrannical God. Okay. Then you've got the other about 1% of the population, which I put us in, where we're aware of this deception. And then what's in the middle? The sheep. It's 98% of the sheep. And they're all shades of gray. Like some that are heavily inclined towards darkness and some that are right on the edge of light and everything in between. And that's what this war is. It's not like a nation is going to win. It's not like communism is going to win or the Russians are going to win or Islam's going to win. Uh-uh. The, we think of wars with borders and territory. But at, another way really to look at this is this is 7 billion individual wars. There's one for each soul. It's a completely different kind of battle than we are even used to even grasping. And it takes some time to start to learn that, to get it. But the first level is propaganda. And look what propaganda did without really develop a developed eugenics program. This is in Nazi Germany. Without genetics, eugenics, without... Um, like psychoanalysis, the Freudian, and it's funny, but Bernays and Freud are related literally by blood. I don't think it's an accident that uh, their two ideals have gone further to separate humanity from God than than so many others combined. Can I interrupt you here? Yeah. <clears throat> Speaking of Bernays and uh, uh, apparently, I haven't read the book, but Gustav Le Bon. Uh, Not familiar the book with is him. called The Crowd. Uh, apparently, that's where Freud and uh, uh, Bernays got a lot of their information. And it's also a book that I guess was uh, written with all the, the big leaders that, that have come up to power in so many years throughout our different uh, generations. You know, Hitler and all these people have read this book, and that's where a lot of their stuff comes from. So, Well, if you read Mein Kampf, it reads like, I think Bernays' book is called Propaganda, right? Yeah, Propaganda, 1928 um, or something. And it, it came out five years before Bernays' book did. And where, where did Hitler learn these techniques on social psychology, on crowd control? Because he was a painter, Okay, he, he was a grunt in World War One. He was an art school flunky. And all of a right? sudden, just as he starts dabbling in the occult, the Nazis are introducing massive jumps in technology. If you if you heard that, and I don't want to be really incorrect here, but I swear I've read this and heard this before that somebody else actually wrote Mein Kampf for him, and he signed it. Possibly. And I want to say it was claimed that the Jesuits were involved in that. No, that could be wild conspiracy. I would don't know. not, l but it's not that shocking. Would it, would it, would it be surprising? <laughs> no. no, that Look, wouldn't. Adolf actually Hitler makes more sense if he was that. a bastard child of Lionel de Rothschild, and some guy named Schickelgruber adopted him at some point with Clara, his mom, and he was literally bre He was literally brought up for this part. This was his purpose in that family and he brought the occult to one nation and I, and I really think Nazi Germany was a test run of what's going to be worldwide very soon so. I mean the same thing that was happening in Nazi Germany in the mid 1930s is what's happening here there's a small group of people that get it and they're talking about it but the rest of the population is shrugging their shoulders going that's impossible yeah. there really are no death camps built yet there are 500 or so in the United States, which can house 20 million people, which Howard pointed out yeah. is about how many true Christians uh, there really enough. are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what's That's the question. I mean, what's interesting with that is the, the people that, you know, they're pointing out. I, you know what happened with the, uh, the Boy Scout get-together with Donald Trump the other day when he, when he spoke to the Boy Scouts in Pennsylvania or Ohio? I didn't see that. No. Oh, he, he, had a, he had a – you guys didn't see any I didn't of see that, no. Wow. So he, he went and spoke to all the Boy Scouts and he had all these kids. And, of course, the funny part about it was he's waving to the kids. And, of course, they got a picture of that and they've got Kyle a picture Hitler. of Adolf oh, Hitler. Oh, now, he, again, Trump's literally yeah, he, Hitler. Again. And, and now these kids are Hitler youth. 
right? Oh, because they're boy. all cheering for him, blah, blah, blah. So that's uh, that's the backstory. But what, what's interesting is, and, and Dave, you know this, that the, the people that brought the Nazis to power are the ones against Trump. Interesting. You know? Yeah, in the 1960s, they were known as the establishment. Right. They, they've, they've got... They've had so many names throughout history. Jesus Christ was the first to identify. I mean, well, look, this goes back to Babylon. This goes back to 1000 BC. Jesus Christ put a name on him, Synagogue of Satan. They morphed. Today, we've, it just in recent modern day culture, they've gone from the establishment, the, the Freemasons, the secret societies, the New World Order, the 1%, the elite. Um, the Illuminati. It, it, we're talking about the same group. It's the same group of people throughout history. And you can identify them by their actions. There's no other way to do it. They don't have a look. They're not inside a specific set of national borders anywhere. Well, that's actually biblical, what you just said. That is how you are to identify them, is by their actions. Exactly. It's so the fruit. It, what fruit do they bear? Yeah. And if that's your litmus test, you, and if once you... It's just like anything. When you study it for a while, you just start to see it so differently. I, um, you know, it's funny. I, was, I hate to keep interrupting you, taking you off your topic. But you, you talk about the fruit. When you talk about someone's fruit, actually Ben Carson, when he mentioned that, when you look at this man's fruit, you, you notice how the media attacked him for that? Well, they'll mock him for it. Yeah, I mean, this is all all part of attacking somebody because you're pointing out what the truth is. And they have to attack you. Yeah, even and, and worse yet, he's using uh, biblical terminology from the Bible, right? right. So it's actually a, a, a teaching right out of the New Testament. So that's open reign now. I mean, of course, the, the bulldogs are going to attack because uh, that's what they're to do. And this is, this is the one of the ways I see that, based on the fruits, you see what these people are doing. Anytime someone brings up the Bible or principles in the Bible or anything to do with anything that we consider the truth— you get attacked. Well, right. and, look, and the vast majority of them are doing it in a somewhat innocent way because they're just the dupes carrying on the deceiver's plan. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting because it was October 13th, 2016 in Florida. Donald Trump gives one of the most astounding speeches of the whole campaign. And you guys should go find that speech. But we there's a few nuggets that were in it. Um that are going to be in this book. Some of the things he said, the corporate media is no longer involved in journalism. Our system is rigged. The establishment has engaged in massive cover-up of widespread criminal activity. This is a struggle for the survival of our nation. This is a crossroads in the history of our civilization. I do think he understands what he's... I think so, too. I think it's clear. I mean, he can't do anything without... I mean, if, if he takes a crap, he didn't do it right. I mean, it just doesn't and, matter and the what he pres- does. I'm, I'm, I used to think the president was the most powerful person in the world. No. He's not even the most powerful person in Washington, D.C. No. And he, frankly, he's many tiers. Well, he's actually not supposed to be the most powerful person in Washington, D.C. Right. So that's But okay, the vast but... majority of the American population believes that is the most powerful man in the world. Right. And I'm just like, no, dude, not you're really. actually looking at... Um, a high level uh, public relations agent. Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't even be surprised if the day he gets sworn in, he gets brought into a room with a bunch of people he's never seen before, and they sit him down and go, "Okay, just so you know, you do you, you don't are do this. not in charge." Yeah, <laughs> and here's what we did to Kennedy. Yeah, here's here, what we did here's to Lincoln. Deal. Here's what we did to McKinley. Here's what we did to Jackson. <laughs> blah blah blah. Right. And uh, if you don't play our game, now he's it, your he, family will be killed. He's fighting them. Which is interesting because, uh, you know, if they are of darkness, which I believe they would be if they're coming at him like that um, and nothing bad's happening, then he clearly is receiving some sort of protection of a spiritual nature. Um, the way the me- – so the first level of mind control is the very basic propaganda. And it's very effective. Oh, it, I mean, works. it works on the vast majority of the population. The mind control I was talking about, now this gets into um, what Russ Dizdar might call the Black Awakening, where he estimates there are 10 million people that are literally programmed through hypnosis, through 
satanic ritual abuse where your personality is essentially destroyed at a very young age and you're rebuilt with multiple personalities and sometimes those personalities do not communicate with each other this is not theory this is actually in the dsm-5 it this is these are accepted scientific facts we've called them many things throughout history multiple personality disorder schizophrenia uh did um you name it. So this article that I was referencing, and it's so interesting to see because in 1972 in front of Congress, there was a congressman named Cornelius, um, what the heck was his name, Graham, I think, or Green, Gallagher, who, now this is 1972. And what's funny is you can see how lazy researchers are. Because someone somewhere along the way accidentally wrote that this was in 1974. And this is one of the hard things of this book because I'm not going to take some dude's word for it. Everything that we're quoting in this book, we're seeing the original source. So to go searching through all the congressional records of 1974 for something, that oh, takes a Lord. hell of a long time. But then you find out, you see where the mistake was made You know, in 1978 some idiot wrote 74 instead of 1972 where it actually was. So now you can see where all these modern authors carry what I think was truly an innocent mistake forward. And then I was telling Howard, then you actually get into the into this it's a 10-page article that was in the 1972 congressional record. And at the top of the congressional record, another error was there, which was that they accidentally typed in 1971. So this thing was very difficult to track down. So in 1972, this congressman gets up, and here's how he starts off his thing. We're not going to be able to get too deep into it. But he says, um, Mr. Speaker, I rise today. This is... The, you know, this is Congressman Gallagher talking. And you find this in the extensions of remarks of the Congressional Record 1972 for the date of February 24th of 1972. That's when this was originally spoken. So this is now 45 years ago. Back then, he was already saying this. I rise today to insert into the Congressional Record one of the most shocking documents I have ever seen. He goes on to call this uh, Mr. Speaker, I've used the words shocking and frightening to describe what this particular uh, psychoanalyst came to him with, a man by the name of Dr. Bregan. What is Bregan's first name? It, it's not that important right now. You'll find it. And basically what they did was, I was looking for a quote by a guy by the name of Dr. Jose Delgado. Familiar with anybody? No. No. This is the guy that, in the 1960s was messing now they come to they came to realize he was messing with humans too not just animals but by implanting a chip in a bull he was able to get a bull in an arena to stop its you know charge what? I, I actually did see some stuff on that but i didn't remember the guy's name okay yeah that's who this guy was comes to find out he was doing this with humans this is a 10 page article we're not going to get into now but it goes into the fact that in 1972, they could program people to kill. They could program people to ignore information. They could program people to feel good when they're actually feeling pain or to feel pain when they're feeling good. And they estimated the numbers of people that are getting this type of... It's a brain. It is a psychosurgery. It's, it's, it's like a lobotomy. And by 1972, the numbers in the United States were already at 50,000. And there were hundreds, if not thousands, of these psycho surgeons that were each doing 300 to 500 operations a year. You do the math since then, and we're talking close wow. to Russ Dizdar's number of yeah. 10 million people programmed. And the thing is, they don't know it. Well, maybe that's where he got his numbers from. They're the from. same type of hypnosis that... You get someone jumping on stage on one foot after hypnotizing him for five minutes. Imagine what you can do with some serious trauma-induced programming 
throw a chip in there and you can build a black army and the black awakening is the red horse of revelation i personally believe that's at least part of it at least a big part of it arm yourselves people yeah because neighbors are going to turn on you and at the end of the day our message the reason we expose the dark side is so you do not get trapped on this prison planet Jesus Christ is the only way out of this dilemma. You got to first understand that there's a lot more to life than just the 70 or so years we spend on earth. There's a lot more to it. Don't blow eternity for some short-term mistakes. You have a way out. Find out who Jesus was. His identity is critical to your soul. I'll leave it at that. Amen, brother. This has been Down the Rabbit Hole. We'll see you next week.